Well, good morning and good afternoon for some. My name is Jennifer Joyce and I am the Regional Vice President of Sales for the Western Territory here at Conducive Technologies, talking with you today about how we can achieve at least 30% faster SQL performance. Now, this webinar is really broken out into two parts. The first part, I'm just going to call that the thought leadership portion, and that's where we're going to just dig in under the hood, get under the technology stack, and start to explain just kind of what are some of the I.O. inefficiencies that are occurring, some I.O. degradation issues that are occurring in the environment, especially if you're running SQL Server, uh, particularly if you have virtualized that environment, but also applicable to physical servers. We want to just talk about what's happening under the hood that's stealing the underlying IOPS and throughput that's causing the underlying storage system to work much harder than it needs to be, ultimately slowing down performance where it doesn't need to be slowed down. So that's the first part. The second part, we're going to talk about some of the inherent I.O. penalties that are occurring. Uh, we're just going to bring a couple of them to light. And uh, then we'll go over an overview, no more, of, no more than 10 minutes, of how we can actually address those issues. Uh, we really just want to talk about, um, uh, you know, what the solution is, which is going to be focused on velocity. This is a set and forget software utility that runs silently in the background on Windows servers. Uh, so if you're, not, if you're not here for a Windows server environment webinar, it's, this is probably not a good use of your time, but if you're running Windows and you're running SQL, this is going to be an excellent use of your time. So we're going to talk about how that software is tackling those I.O. inefficiencies within that Windows and SQL context and how we solve it and how we can get that 30% or more faster experience. You know, obviously the compelling event here is that, you know, there's other ways to solve performance issues than just throwing more hardware at it. I know hardware has gotten cheap over the years, but when you have to buy a lot of it, it's not so cheap anymore. This is a unique solution that can actually solve that problem, it, 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 and it is a software problem, it's not a hardware problem, with a 100% software approach. Now, we're also going to be giving complimentary NFR at the end of the webinar, uh, you know, and just a quick housekeeping item, the webinar is recorded. If you have to drop off at any point, you will get the recording and you will get your free NFR for having attended uh, at least a portion of the webinar today, and that is more than a 500 MSRP value. We want to make sure that you can use the software because really where the rubber meets the road is where you're going to see the results. The proof is in the pudding. So with that said, just a, enough of an introduction there, I would like to announce and introduce my partner in crime, Howard Butler. Uh, he's on this call with us. He is the Senior Director of Systems Engineering. And uh, I'll just say this, uh, a quick little tag for Howard. If, uh, if there's anybody on here who's a, a big car buff, um, if you're ever on a one-on-one -on -one call with Howard, try to, try to talk about uh, that with him because he not only specializes in accelerating performance in computers, he is also actually a race car instructor. Uh, so Howard, I'll turn it over to you real quick. Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. Always glad to uh, join you here. And by the way, guys, don't let Jennifer's title fool you. She's quite technical as well, as you'll see as we get going along here. But one of the things I did want to mention, Jennifer, is that we'd like to really make this session interactive. So there is a Q&A box over there, and as we go through this presentation and discussion and so forth, if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to write them up, and then we'll either get to them during the session as part of our interactive conversation with you or get to them at the very end. So thanks very much, Jennifer, for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here, Howard. Uh, you're going to keep me out of trouble. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. Okay. <laughs> so it's a hard task to do. Uh, I'm pretty good at getting into trouble. Um, so let's, let's carry on here. We're going we're gonna to just give you a quick overview of conducive technologies. Now, uh, personally, I, when I come to a presentation like this myself, I really want to know who I'm talking to, but I don't want them to spend too, too much time on telling me who they are. So I need to know who I'm talking to. I need to know what their street cred is, but then let's move on into the meat and potatoes. So that's exactly what we're going to do. I'll keep this very high level. Now, some of you may not have heard of conducive technologies before, and you may be wondering, okay, why in the world do we have, you know, this company think they have any thought leadership to be talking about this subject? Well, here's why. Um, we are actually a 38-year-old company. Dawn, I think we've got to update that slide. It's a little, 
<laughs> We've been around for 38 years now, I think. And uh, we are actually the 12th oldest software company in the world um, that we that we know still exists. So that's saying something. As you put translate on, you know, software years, uh, that's a very, very long time. Now we originally started out as a company known as DiskKeeper, and some of you may have heard of that company. In fact, some of you may have used or are still using that software. It has evolved, but about five years ago, the company we brought out. Um, a really revolutionary intellectual property into the marketplace, and it had absolutely nothing to do with our legacy of, uh, of defragmenting, which we were known for as the number one disk defragmenter for the Windows environment for the past 20 plus years. But we had to evolve. We had to come up with new approaches and new ways to optimize performance, and that's what, exactly what we did, but with that long legacy. Um, so now we are focused today on velocity, which is for both physical and virtual servers. And you can put this on any given SQL system and get an anywhere between a 30 to 40% reduction in IO traffic and consequently the equivalent amount of throughput. Uh, we find that the Windows operating system is just stealing IOPS, stealing throughput, um, and that we've found a way with our software solution to solve that. Now, a couple other things about us that you can see on the slide here, Gartner Cool Vendor. They gave us the Cool Vendor nod because they literally had no quadrant to put us into. There is nobody who can do what we can do, especially with our legacy, our deep relationship with Microsoft. Um, at some point, uh, we've actually even had access to the Microsoft operating system source code and have written some of the uh, line items that went into the original source codes. So that's, uh, that's how deep we go. We're also a VMware tap partner. We do have a, uh, a page up on their partner portal. Uh, so just a little bit about us. So I think I've uh, probably belabored that enough, but I do want to just mention these OEM relationships as well. We'll come back to that a little bit later on one of the core engines that we're focused on in our software today as a major solution that accelerates performance. So just a little bit about us. Okay, so we want to get into um, a little bit of kind of the lay of the land and explain what's happening that's creating all this noise and unnecessary IO traffic. You know, what is this IO degradation issue that steals this performance? Now, let me just give you a couple of opening slides here real briefly on market research that we've done that you might find interesting. Now, earlier in the year, we conducted uh, we believe is the largest independent study done on IO performance. Uh, this is on over 1,000 IT professionals, and we've actually done the survey for a number of years in a row now. And, you know, it's interesting, we asked them, you know, how many of you have performance problems so bad that you're actually getting staff or customer complaints due to the sluggish performance? You know, slow queries, slow performance, batch jobs taking too long. Well, the graph shows it. You'll see that 28% of all organizations raised their hands and said, yes, that's us. We do have slow SQL performance bad enough where we get complaints. Now the funny thing is, is that over the years that we've been doing this survey, this number has not gotten any better. Last year it was around 27%. We've gone up by 28%, this incremental creep. Um, but it's right still in that pocket of a full quarter of people are suffering from this. So if you're on this webinar and you fit into that category, we won't be surprised if, uh, if you're one of those people raising your hand going, yeah, could use a little help here. Um, so the next question that we asked, uh, was of all your IO intensive applications that you support, which one is the most challenging and what are you struggling with the most? So we did a word cl cloud here. Uh, the most number of responses are in the larger fonts. That's pretty, speaks for itself. SQL and anything running a database. Um, so seven out of 10 of our customers who come to us and become customers do so because of needing to support performance on a database like SQL. That is really the place where people are feeling the most pain. Okay, now let me just jump on to the next slide here. I think that's enough of a setup. So before I give you a picture of what's actually occurring and what the mess looks like and what the IO de degradation issues are that I'm talking about, I think it helps to start with this view of what healthy IO profile actually looks like. Um, this is what we want it to look like for optimal throughput. Now, as you can see here on the screen, this is a very rudimentary extraction, obviously, you know, of your IO profile. This is obviously oversimplified, but I think the takeaway is pretty obvious and immediate. You can see that you get nice, large, clean, contiguous writes and reads, and you can see you're getting a healthy payload of data with every I.O. operation. You can notice how nice and sequential the nature of your traffic looks. Now, this is an optimal environment. 
Okay, this is what we want, and this will give you the best performance you can get from your underlying flash hybrid or disk storage. But the moment that you take a SQL Server and you virtualize it, and obviously, you know, you're running that SQL Server on Windows, you know that, the, uh, you know, on what we're talking about here on this slide is not what you get. It looks a lot more like this. Now, again, kind of going with that same theme of that rudimentary extraction here, what we saw before and what we see now, this is actually what's happening in your environment. And again, I think you, the, the immediate takeaway is very obvious. Suddenly now in this environment, the IO characteristics are much more, you know, they're much smaller, more fractured, and more random that, than they need to be. I would kind of refer to this as death by a thousand cuts. And you know, this is causing the underlying sub-storage system to work much harder than it needs to be. I kind of call this the, the perfect trifecta of bad performance. Now, it, it's kind of an interesting thing, too, because one of the things that, you know, I've been with the company for a while now, not, not anywhere near as long as Howard. Howard started when he was five. He's, he's a, a veteran of our company, um, one of our titans. But uh, I've been here for about a little over a decade now. And when I first started here, we were still a defragmentation company. That's no longer the case. But we really focused on the fact that back then, the disk used to be the weak link. That was the problem. That's not the case anymore. You guys have flash. You have tiered storage. Many of you are now going hyper-converged. Some of you are even going cloud, and you don't even own the disk anymore. Here's the issue, is that now that disk is fast, and you've got tons of it, and you've got hundreds of thousands of IOPS potentially in your environment, uh, the problem is now that the Windows operating system has become the weak link. It used to be that the Windows operating system would throw out data and the disk could not keep up. It's actually an inverted problem now. The disk can handle way more than the Windows operating system is throwing out. And guess what? The Windows operating system is now the weak link. It could be doing a ton more than it's doing, and it's governing itself by this bad organization of data. That's where we come in. And that's why I mentioned now it's no longer a hardware problem. The disk isn't the problem anymore. It's now the Windows operating system that's holding everything back, and we can speed it up. Most people are not doing this level of optimization right within the Windows operating system because they simply don't know that it can be done. Once they learn about velocity and they realize that this software it's a system of many file filter drivers that embed right into the Windows operating system, Microsoft Gold certified, no one else can do it. They realize I can optimize this piece of my environment and get 30 to 40 percent more throughput directly from Windows and get that SQL database performing like it should be. Because it doesn't make sense. A lot of people are scratching their head going, I got 100,000 IOPS, I'm using 3 percent of it. Why am I still having performance issues? This is usually why when you're in that situation. Now, if, uh, let me, let me, uh, I got a little excited there. Let me, let me continue here. So what we want to do is we kind of want to dig under the hood and see what's causing this. Why is Windows inflicting these I.O. penalties into your environment? Now, on this slide, uh, what we're going to talk about is the, the first penalty is, I'm going to start at the bottom of the slide. We're going to look at the I.O. blender effect. Now, the I.O. blender effect, it's likely that you've heard that term. It's actually sourced by us and Gartner. We helped Gartner coin it about five or six years ago when virtualization, maybe seven years ago when virtualization was first coming across the landscape. And the IO blender effect is what happens the moment that you virtualize more than one server and you put more than one server on a host hypervisor, okay? So on a physical server, in a physical environment, you have that one-to-one -one relationship. But as soon as you go into that shared platform, that shared footprint, this problem starts showing up, okay? So there's no fix for what happens here apart from what our software does. So as, as great as virtualization is for server efficiency, one of the biggest downsides is that it adds complexity to the data path. And what happens is that the host now mixes and randomizes otherwise uh, independent I.O. streams and now delivers down to storage this much more randomized pattern than then it would have to deal with otherwise. So you add the first VM, it, you're, it's okay. You add the second VM, this starts. The third VM, the fourth VM, and so on. And this just amplifies and compounds and kind of force multiplies this degradation. Now, I know we haven't gotten to any kind of Q&A kind of section yet or anything, and, and I'm still laying the, setting the table here. But guys, as you have questions, I'm sure there's a few questions popping into heads already. Please start putting them into the Q&A box. We do want to keep this interactive. 
uh, Howard and I will be taking questions during the presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely try to stay on track time-wise, uh, and then we'll certainly have a really good dynamic Q&A session afterwards. Uh, so don't be shy. If you're thinking the question, probably three or four more other people are thinking it as well. Uh, do everyone a favor and drop those in. Okay, so now one of the things that I want to touch on, uh, I'm going to go back to this slide here, is that when we're talking about this performance degradation, sometimes it's really obvious, like it is in that SQL environment where, you know, hey, this server is really dragging. But there's other scenario too, and this is, this is really hidden from a lot of people. And the reason it's hidden is because as virtualization occurred on kind of most organizations, yeah, we're now 10% virtualized, now we're 30%. Everyone's like up to 80, 90, 99% virtualization now. But they didn't notice the slow creep of performance degradation because they didn't flip the switch overnight. Now, we did have a customer who did flip the switch overnight. Uh, one of the customers that we work with very closely, Christus Health, uh, they have us on over 2,300 servers, uh, physical and virtual. Uh, they don't have very much physical left at all, just a handful of servers, but this is about 25, 2,300 to 2,500 virtual servers. They actually flipped the switch overnight. Now, they're up to 2,300 servers now. At the time, they had about 2,000 servers. And Howard, I believe you were involved with that evolution. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit about what happened when they just kind of, you know, lights on on this new data center and went completely virtual. Sure thing. Thanks very much, Jennifer. So, guys, you know, with Christus, they did their testing on individual uh, systems, like many of you would. And what they were expecting is that when they went from physical to virtual, they'd get the same kind of performance. But when they virtualized all those systems, unfortunately, they didn't get the same kind of performance. They actually saw a performance degradation during that, uh, and during that analysis, what they found to be the issue wasn't CPU related. It wasn't a memory bottleneck. It was a bottleneck, Jennifer associated with IO traffic. And that's what was really causing the, the majority of their issues. Now, their first reaction was, gee, we're going to have to upgrade all of our storage here, and we're going to have to go to an all-flash type array to try to solve these type of problems. But before they did that, they had um, attended one of our um, presentations uh, at, a, at a conference, they got a hold of our software, and they put it to test. And they saw that the software did indeed do exactly as we said, and it did solve their IO performance bottleneck. So Jennifer, rather than them spending, what was it, something like $2 million to yeah, do a forklift you know, replacement of all their storage to go to a new flash type of, of storage array, we saved them from being able to, to expend that money and, and use that money elsewhere in a more tangible fashion. Well, Howard, that, I thank you for reviewing that. And it's funny because I, I now manage the account, but this, this all happened before I managed the account. We were having dinner with him last, last summer, and I asked him, because the case study is incredible. It's on our website. Go grab it. Um, but, you know, we were having dinner with him. I'm like, I'm like, did this actually happen? And they're like, ah, absolutely, every word of that's true. Uh, so that was, that was a really, really neat story for you guys to be able to check out. Now, as difficult as this IO Blender effect penalty is that's being caused by virtualization, there's actually even a worse penalty upstream, and that's the one being caused by the Windows operating system. Now, I alluded to this earlier, um, but uh, let, me, let me go ahead and just kind of go into this a little bit more because we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are the only company who can play in this area. Uh, we have the proprietary and sole software solution that solves this problem nesting right into the Windows operating system. And one question I get a lot, and speaking of that, I don't see any questions yet, but as you guys have questions, please start dropping them in. Uh, one que question I get a lot is, is is your software compatible with fill in the blank? And, uh, you know, it's naming different types of SANS, different types of hypervisors, different types of applications, you name it. We are compatible with Windows. We install inside of Windows. We're fenced within Windows. And if it is compatible with Windows, it is compatible with us. So the question to you, are you compatible with blank? If it's compatible with Windows, we can play. So we're good to go on all hardware platforms. Now, there's, there's some severe inefficiencies in the handoff of data between the Windows operating system and the underlying storage. Let me get back to that. There are no APIs that connect the two other than using the rudimentary framework that Windows has already used, um, always uses in that environment. 
uh, by addressing the logical disk to write the data. And Howard, I know this creates a really serious problem because the Windows operating system for any given file that should be written in red with just one I.O. or two I.O.s or just a minimal number of operations, Windows ultimately takes any given file and breaks it down to be much smaller than it actually needs to be. And ultimately what happens is you end up in a situation where you're processing four I.O.s or multiple, multiple I.O.s for a single file that really should have been written in red with just one I.O. So Howard, maybe I could just tap you on the shoulder here real quick to give us a little bit more about what's actually happening. Why is Windows so inefficient in the handoff of data? Well, you know, to really think about this, you know, the Windows file system does take kind of a one-size-fits-all type of approach. You know, when a file gets created or extended, the Windows file system doesn't really know how big that file ultimately is going to be. So what it will do is that on the logical side within the Windows file system, it looks for the next fixed allocation size. And if the file extension or file size is going to be bigger than what that segment of free space that Windows is now about to allocate, um, if that extension is bigger, it's going to write what it can into that location, and then it's going to go find another, uh, the next available free space. And it's going to continue down that process of allocating little tiny segments of free space. Each of those um, extra allocations takes a separate I.O. request to be processed. So rather than getting one large sequential stream of I.O., what Windows is causing is all these little small, chopped up, uh, random, fractured IOs um, that are truly the toughest problem for storage systems to try to process. And as you'll see, as you're getting all those uh, small, random IOs from the system itself, if you ever go and look at any type of benchmark utilities, you know, where they create an artificial workload, you're going to, they usually give you two different types of numbers. They'll give you a measurement score for random IOs and for sequential IOs. And you will always notice that those sequential IOs outperforms the random ones. So if we can help enforce to the file system, into Windows, that most of your IO traffic are going to be these larger, more sequential type of IO requests, that's how you're going to get the best performance from your environment. Well, thank you for the overview, Howard. I really appreciate it. You know, another example is crossing my mind, and that's the University of Illinois. Um, they actually had their hardest hitting databases were a combination of Oracle and SQL, uh, and the Oracle running in Windows. Um, so they were running those databases on the latest Dell servers. Uh, they had compellent all flash arrays in their environment. And, uh, you know, kind of on day one, they had a great experience with their performance, but about a year in, performance had begun to degrade uh, so much that they thought they were going to have to add more flash arrays to get more IOPS to meet their SLAs to their end users. Um, but this is only a year into that hardware environment, so they, they're kind of like, yeah, that's, that's not really what we want to do. So they started sleuthing around for, for solutions. They came across us, uh, and they found out what we did. You know, our evaluation of our software is completely free. They tried it. They figured they had nothing to lose, and we more than doubled the performance on top of their existing flash arrays by solving this upstream problem of this small split, you know, Windows tax kind of I.O. I, I was on the call with a customer the other day. I'm not sure if I'm going to use this phrase or not, but, but – um, they just finished an evaluation, Howard. They had uh, uh, two ho a smaller environment. They've got two hosts with 14 VMs. And uh, per our recommendation, they just put the trial on all 14 VMs. We got on the phone with them, and they said it got rid of all our garbage I.O. And I said, how, do you, how, do, how did you tell that? And uh, they said, well, we used to get uh, all these disk alerts. Eighty percent of them have gone away. They talked about all sorts of drops and stuff they had in their environment disappearing. And then something that I've always called the Windows shadow effect, where it's just those, uh, they phrased it as all those niggling little problems in the environment disappeared. And that's what we see, Howard, when someone deploys on all of the VMs in the environment and they get rid of the Windows I.O. tax from universally from every VM and they get rid of it at the I.O. blender effect level going down to storage. So that's pretty, pretty powerful. Now I think we've spent like the whole webinar on this slide, so <laughs> let's, let's continue. Um, guys, I, I appreciate you guys uh, sticking with us. We're coming to the bottom of the hour. Um, I got a little excited earlier, maybe a little bit off track. We'll, we'll go through the rest of the slides as quickly as we can without sacrificing content. Um, 
but if rest assured, if you do have a hard stop and you have to drop off, we will send you the replay, but we hope you can stick with us past the bottom of the hour. Um, so now on this slide, what we want to just really focus on real quickly, uh, Howard and I mentioned that we were going we to give you this overview. There's really two engines that we really want to talk about, okay, and, this before, and, and also at the end of the webinar, we'll make sure we hand off that NFR to you. Um, our marketing team will be sending those out right as soon as the webinar ends. Um, but here, what we want to talk about is how we, how we address these issues, okay? There's two major engines. One addresses writes, the other addresses reads, and we're going to move on. So let's talk first about how we address the writes, okay? Now, Howard, you know, we already talked about how Windows has this issue where it's only looking for the next available allocation of the logical disk layer, whether it's the right size or not. Now, what we want to do is give Windows some credit in this sense because a freshly formatted NTFS volume isn't so bad, but it is going to start degrading right after it's been put into use, okay? But as time goes on and these files are written, erased, rewritten, and extended, that's where the issue and the breakdown really starts to build up. And Windows is actually going for a next available space write logic, Howard, and, and it's looking for the next fit. So here's what happens. If you're trying to write a 64K file and the next available space is only 4K, it will fill that 4K. It will split, find the next available location, fill it, split, rinse, and repeat until the entire file is fully written. And I'm talking at the logical disk layer. I'm not talking about down at storage. Remember, we're dealing with a file system, not block-based organization of data. Now, Howard, we have a patented technology that can actually solve that problem proactively and make sure that we're getting Windows to deliver that file with optimal density for every I.O. So will you just share with us briefly a little bit about the kind of intelligence that we're adding here to you know, coax Windows into this type of behavior for that optimal performance? Sure. You know, and Jennifer, as I said before, the file system doesn't really know how big the file creation or extension is going to be. So as you said, you know, it's just looking for the next allocation. Well, what we're doing is something rather simple. In the background, we're able to monitor your system, and we're saying to ourselves, hey, if this particular file type or this application, um, when it gets a request to create or extend a file, we know from that behavioral analytics of what we're seeing happening in your environment that we're monitoring, that it's going to be a particular size or this file is likely to be this big and so forth. We can just feed that intelligence back to the file system. So the file system now truly knows that when a file is being created, how big it's going to be or likely to be, and we can serve up or provide Windows the best allocation location, the best, you know, next best um, size of the free space. So now that file gets written in a very nice sequential fashion. So now, if you think about this, it's very simple. Um, in, in terms of providing this intelligence to the file system so it can do a better job. And I like to use this kind of analogy. Imagine, guys, if you wanted to carry a gallon of water from one place to the other, okay? You could do that with a 100 small individual little Dixie cups and kind of go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Or don't you think it would be much more efficient if you had all of that in one big giant container, you could just take the single container and go across the room. So that's what we're helping the file system to enforce. Nice sequential writes, which by the way, as you improve those writes, anytime you read back that same data, you're also getting a benefit and a performance increase. So it's going to be much more efficient and more optimal if we can provide that intelligence back to the file system, Jennifer. Thank you, Howard. And now on this one, I'm guessing there's going to be some questions. I see that we've got a few questions in there from Alvaro. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be getting to those in just a minute. Um, I do want to try to get to the content for everyone. We're going to um, hit the Q&A right at the end. But if there are questions about this more technical content, please start dropping those in, and Howard will be answering those questions when we get to the Q&A here. That will be just in about five minutes for those of you still hanging on. Um, in fact, I can see nobody's dropped off at all. Great. I'm glad everyone's still here with us. Um, so we'll get through the, the rest of the content here. But uh, I, th I think on what Howard's been talking about here is kind of the net takeaway 
is that this intelligence really helps Windows operating system find that best allocation of the logical layers since the next available is rarely, if ever, the right size. Okay, now, Howard, as powerful that, as that engine is, let's move on to the next engine and cover this one as well. Um, this one, it, this one's really cool. This is actually a DRAM read caching engine. Okay, we're establishing, you know, if you've got tiered storage and you've got a tier one level flash cache at your, your SAN, you can think of this as a tier zero cache strategy for your environment. Simply by leveraging the idle available DRAM sitting there on any given VM or physical server, we're just putting that memory to use while it's otherwise sitting there cool in its heels. You've got an incredible resource there in memory. Uh, you know, reading from memory is going to be 10 to 15 times faster than even reading from your, your flash storage. Uh, so we can put that resource to use. There's really uh, one thing about this engine that I, I really want to highlight, the real genius of this engine is that it's completely automatic. You do not have to carve out or allocate any extra memory for cache. Um, you know, typically your, um, your, store, your server already has enough. In the case of SQL, there is an exception. If you have not placed any limits on how much memory SQL can use, it tends to gobble up everything in the environment. So in that case, we're probably going to want to see a, a memory limit added to SQL. And we certainly can consult with you on what that would look like. 4 gigs, 8 gigs, 12 gigs, depends on the size of your server to be effective. Um, the other thing, too, is that when people hear, you know, caching, they often think it's going to be really capacity intensive and take a lot of memory, especially since, you know, SQL's kind of trained us into it taking everything. Not the case here, not to worry. Uh, we are very efficient, uh, what's very selective of what goes in the cache, and our cache hit rates are exceptionally high because we're only caching hot logical data blocks that are repetitively accessed. Um, and if it's not likely that that's going to be read again, it simply won't be in our cache. So, you know, the other thing, too, is that it really does play nicely in the sandbox. It does not require, uh, it's, there's not going to be resource contention because we're in there. Um, one thing I'll mention is that we do leave a minimum amount free at all times before we can even start. That's our starting line. A certain amount has to be free at all times. Uh, so what that means is that you're never going to run into any kind of a memory contention or resource starvation situation. And uh, so we're going to be able to offload all of those hot reads that otherwise would have to go down the full stack, down to storage, and back and alleviate that from the network. So Howard, let me, let me uh, tip it back over to you and see if there's anything that you'd like to add back onto that. Well, you're right, Jennifer. There are two things that are, you know, rather unique about our IntelliMemory caching, which is why, you know, we have nine of the top 10 PC OEM manufacturers licensing our technology. And, of course, you probably haven't heard of us because they license under their own name. But the two things, as you indicated, is the dynamic memory usage, and we'll only use what's free and available, um, not to be used out there. And if the system or other processes needs or wants that memory, we gladly automatically give that up so there's no memory contention. So you're not having to, you know, squirrel away or set aside a fixed amount of memory just for our cache, and we'll dynamically allocate and choose to use memory that nobody else is using. Now, the second part is the intelligence of what to put and keep in the cache for the best benefit. And, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, that behavioral analytics, um, you know, a lot of caching technologies use something like, hey, the data was read, let me put it in cache, and kind of hope that it gets read, if not, readjust and throw the stuff out. Well, like I said, that behavioral analytic approach that we take, we know firsthand based upon our observation of the workload involved, what your applications are truly reading from, Knowing at what time that's occurring, how repetitive it is, we can make the best judgment as to what to put in a cache and how long it should stay in there. And, you know, what you're going to find, especially in a SQL environment, I mean, SQL does a fairly good job of caching some of its own internal data, but, gee, guys, guess what? That's not the only I.O. traffic that's occurring on that Windows server. It may be one of your more important applications, but there are literally thousands and thousands of IOs that are happening all at the same time. And if we can help eliminate and reduce the congestion of IOs coming both from SQL as well as other sources um, in that system, then we're going to have the, the biggest performance gain and uh, be able to truly eliminate 
a very large portion of the unnecessary I.O. traffic from having to go, to go down to storage. So that's kind of what we're doing there. We reside on the VM, okay, on the systems, and if we can cache that data, that means that we're satisfying those reads as memory-to-memory -memory type of data transfers, which literally are 10 to 15 times faster than going to flash or SSD. So this is where you're going to see a huge performance gain um, as we can continue to offload that unnecessary I.O. traffic and increase the bandwidth of the I.O. traffic that does go to storage uh, that it can be used for other useful things, Jennifer. That's fantastic. Okay, guys, so we're going to start wrapping it up here and get into um, the handoff of the NFR and best practices on evaluating and, and also answering your Q&A. Uh, just highlight a couple of things um, for you on this. I'm just going to talk about uh, just one or two of these. Um, this is a deployment that I, I got to do right in the middle of the screen, ASL marketing. This was a pretty neat one. Um, you know, we had a situation where they didn't have the budget to rip and replace their hybrid storage, and they wanted to see what we could do for them. They had a, uh, a batch job that was taking 27 hours to import, and it was supposed to be overnight. Do the math, 27 hours does not equal overnight. Um, and we got that down to 12 hours. That was a pretty big one. Uh, they were astounded. It was a great case study call to, to be on and be part of. Um, another one that's real interesting, uh, Stockport College. They had enrollment. Uh, that was taking 15 minutes on enrollment day. Servers were stalling. Uh, they did the upgrades. They got Velocity in there, and it went down to five minutes. They liked it so much they tried it on another application um, on their payroll reports. I know that uh, Crystal reports were in there in the mix as well, speeding up. So just a lot of really great stuff here. And um, again, we'll, we'll uh, move along here uh, so we can get to the, uh, the prize. Just some more case study type stuff. Um, let's go ahead and move on. Just really great performance type stuff. We want to be able to see this in your environment, so let's talk about what the product does. This is what the UI looks like. You're going to get a real nice layout of the total IOs eliminated, what percentage of that is reads, what percentage of that is writes. You can scale it up and down to see it on different time frames. And you're also going to, well, there's no more UIs here, but you're also going to be able to see um, very detailed information on our memory utilization, dynamic memory utilization for caching, our, our read cache uh, success rates, how much of uh, that read traffic is being served from that. And it also, uh, we have a centralized management console, which is super nice. You can get a stacked view of every single server individually and the performance benefits you're getting on each server. Now let's talk about uh, best practices. Now the step one, add more DRAM if possible. Okay, let's take that back a step as well and say what we typically see is that most servers already have enough DRAM on them. In the case of SQL, you may be looking at placing a, a cap somewhere, a limit somewhere to make sure that you have between 4 to 16 gigs free. Um, so on all other servers besides SQL and Exchange, we found that caps pretty much aren't necessary, and 98% of systems and environments already have more than enough soft, uh, uh, memory on them to, to accommodate. So it's going to be very minor tweaking with that. Um, I've already touched on step two, and step three, monitor the velocity dashboard. So within 48 hours, you're going to start having some meaningful information coming out. If you're seeing really low read percentages, we probably don't have a cap on SQL, or there's no read traffic because we're only caching reads. Uh, so all of that analytics will be in the dashboard, and you can certainly schedule a call with myself, Howard, or your, per, you know, your uh, account manager or SE that covers your territory. Um, so that's really kind of how we want to engage is just get you the software, and we do want to hand off that NFR. So you're going to be getting a free NFR. Now I'm going to um, just throw this out here real quick. There's two things that you might want to drop into the conversation box right, right now. Um, and I'm going to tell you what they both are. So the first one is, rather than just testing with your one license NFR on one server, we can get you trialware to run on multiple servers, and we can get you the console, the Velocity Management Console. You can run it on every server in your environment, like the guys I was talking about earlier that had the 14 VMs. They threw it on everything, and they got the results. Um, so if you would like that and not just the NFR in the chat box, please type in VMC. That's Velocity Management Console. Just type in VMC. Um, and we'll make sure that when we deliver your NFR that we also get you the trialware and the console. Okay. The other thing that I'm going to mention as well is uh, that we do have an IO health check tool called IOAT. So to type in IOAT if you want this, the IO assessment tool, the conducive IO assessment tool. This tool is really, really neat. It, you can do an IO health check 
on whatever servers you want in your environment to see if they're even candidates, to see if they even have the IO degradation that we've been describing, especially your SQL servers. It'll also give us a pre-check if you've got enough free memory or not, or if you're going to want to look at making memory adjustments. Um, it's agentless. It, it's just using remote WMI calls to collect existing PerfMon data from those target servers, so nothing has to get installed on those servers, so really no change control requirements there. Uh, so if you want that, type in IOET. If you want them both, type in both. Um, and what we do recommend as the best practice is to deploy Velocity to all the VMs on a host or even all the VMs in your environment, at a minimum if you're doing this on SQL, on your SQL server, but if you've got other points that that data is flowing through, for example, it's a three-tier architecture and you've got uh, maybe an app server and a web server, each of those servers adds a potential point of latency. I'd recommend putting Velocity on all three. So that's our presentation today. We're, let's go ahead, Howard, and drop into the Q&A box. I see we've got a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so I'm just going to start from the top and we're going to just go straight down the list. Keep throwing them in. We will stay on the line as long as there are questions coming in. Uh, the first question from Alvaro is, is this problem happening for SQL 2017 on Linux? So, Howard, I'll tip you on that one. Well, a part of this does occur in the Linux environment, uh, especially that I.O. Blender effect. Um, you know, our target audience here today are for systems running uh, a Microsoft Windows OS, and you probably do have some mixture of both Windows and non-Windows platforms. Our solution set is directly for Windows, but if you recognize the fact that all of these VMs live perhaps on the same host or are connected to the same type of storage, we can significantly reduce that blender effect and even help on those non-Windows platforms by solving the I.O. traffic that's occurring at the Windows level. So it's kind of going to be a you know, a give and take type of thing there, but our solution is mostly focused on, on the Windows side of things. Fantastic. So we, we just have maybe four or five actual question questions. Everyone else is the VMC and IOAT. So uh, we're going to get through these questions pretty quickly. If you are holding on to a question you haven't dropped in the box yet, we will wrap up the call as soon as we get to the last question. So drop them in now so we don't miss you. Um, so Alvaro also asks, are you guys doing any demo of the product? I, that's been answered, I believe, at the end of the webinar here, absolutely. Uh, you can use it on everything. Now, Howard, another question, a good one from Alvaro, is, is this problem happening for Windows 2016? It's happening on Windows 2016. It's happening on newer versions of Windows. It's happening on the older versions of Windows. It is the Windows NTFS file system. And upgrading to a different version of Windows is not fixing the problem. This has been, you know, we've been doing this since, uh, you know, the good old Windows NT days, all the way back to Windows NT351, and the same situation of split IOs um, and unnecessary IO traffic has been the bane of performance for Windows applications and systems since day one. We are a tried and true solution that Microsoft acknowledges and recognizes. As we even have a SQL certification uh, with Microsoft uh, to know that uh, we play well with all the applications in your environment and so forth, and that's a pretty big feather in our cap. So yes, it, it is effective, uh, a problem that is apparent in current and past versions of Windows. Well, and Howard, you know, the SQL certification you mentioned, we didn't mention that at all during the webinar. That actually, we're the, as far as I know, we're the only software publisher that has been certified. Usually that certification is very elite and reserved for the, the really large hardware manufacturers like, you know, like HP and IBM and things like that, right? So true, so true. It's a very elite certification and, you know, a pretty big feather in our cap to, to have that. So. That's really cool. Um, Kwong Pham asks, can we put a cap on how much velocity can use? So this is, oh, and he asked this when we were talking about telememory, or when we were talking about the yeah. recaching. Yeah, so certainly you could put a cap on how much memory we're using, but let me reemphasize this. We're only using memory that's already free, idle, and unused. So, and we are dynamic. So there really isn't a need to put a limit or a cap on how much memory. Why would you want to throttle this back? If the memory is just sitting there idle and nobody's using it, why not have us use that memory 
for the betterment of your environment and because we will be able to detect when there's a memory demand and be able to shrink or purge our cache and give that memory back to Windows, pretty much eliminates the need to put a limit on how much we can use. Now, Howard, if someone wanted to, they could. Oh, yeah, they could. Yeah, and, and there's a natural cap in place as well uh, that we have that starting line. It's, it's anywhere from 1.5 gigs to 3 gigs has to be free at all times for us to even think about starting to cache. Uh, so if you have a specific environment that you feel like you want to put a cap on uh, velocity, yes, you can, uh, but we just don't have anyone do it because we found it to be very unnecessary. Um, the next question is from Brian Fowler. I assume that this is not limited to VMs. Can this be used on a physical server with SQL Server with the same results, or is it more focused on data pushed through a hypervisor? Howard? Well, I'm going to let you in on a little bit of secret here. We work equally well with both virtual machines as well as Windows physical machines. So have at it. We'll be able to deliver the same kind of performance benefit. Again, it's not tied into the type of hypervisor or the type of hardware that you have. It really is the fact that you're running Windows, and Windows is causing this, this bottleneck issue to, to occur. So by installing our software on physical Windows servers and the virtual Windows servers, you're going to get performance improvements. You know, Howard, and I'm going to build on that a little bit too, um, that you, a couple of things I'm going to say is that the physical server environment is really interesting because it, a lot of people have their physical servers now SAN attached. So from that, that IO Blender effect slide where we had the Windows IO tax when we had the, you know, the Blender effect from the hypervisor down to SAN, well, that Blender effect still affects SQL servers that are attached to a shared storage. Just remove the hypervisor piece. In fact, we have, and this one's really, really fascinating, a proof of concept that Howard and I wrapped up uh, just a few months ago. We had somebody come in with a SAN that had 600,000 IOPS. It was the biggest one I've ever done a POC on before. Uh, it was an all flash pure storage. And they had only 11 physical servers attached to it. That's how big these workloads were. Like that sensitive, right? And they still were missing their SLAs. Um, and they asked us, you know, what can you do for us? We've got 600,000 IOPS and we're just using maybe 10,000 of them. And uh, why, why do you think you could help us? And we, we explained the whole story like we've explained today. But they said, you know, with all that room above us, what, how could you possibly help? Here's my answer to them. I said, you know, and, and it popped into my head this way, actually. I felt the original way I answered them. Um, I, I had the good fortune of living in Spain, in the north of Spain, in Santiago de Compostela, and there's a huge cathedral there that is a massive destination for pilgrims. They leave Italy, they walk 1,500 miles, they end up at this cathedral. And when I was living there, it was actually the year of the pilgrimage, the year of St. James when, when it falls on that Sunday. I'd go into this cathedral, and it was jam-packed with all these pilgrims all the time. I could barely walk through it. And um, the reason this popped into my head is because the last week I was there, the, the pilgrimage had ended, and I walked into the cathedral, and it was completely empty. It was incredible. I was like, wow, I have this place to myself for the first time all year. And it was interesting because I, there's, you know, six-story cathedral ceilings in this place, and there's all the, you know, I kind of popped into my head because of the 600,000 IOPS. There's all this IOPS. There's all this room, but I couldn't use all that space above my head to walk through this building. There were so many people that I was stuck, and I could only use that five to six feet of space that I was in. Think of that as the I.O. that you're actually using, the work that's actually being done. We're not looking at how much capacity and power and bandwidth you have. We're looking at the work that's actually being done, and that work is being done very, very inefficiently. That work is being done with 30 to 40 to 50 percent more I.O. than needs to be there. So my experience was it was basically someone came in and said, hey, half of you get out of the room and the rest of you go all sit down in the pews. And now I could walk right through the room. It was incredible. So that's what our software does. We, f we focus on the, the space where the work is being done, and that's why we make a difference even in over-provisioned environments. You can literally get 30 to 40 percent or faster throughput gains by focusing on organizing the actual work that's being done and ignoring all of the extra uh, capacity that's not actually being used. Um, and so in the case of this particular customer that had the 11 um, 
the 11 uh, physical servers attached to the, this all flash SAN, we actually took their data warehouse job and when we deployed to all 11 VMs, we, and it didn't work when we just deployed to the data warehouse only, they had no change. When we deployed to the other 10 VMs, the data warehouse job went down from eight hours to four hours. We shaved three hours off overnight. Uh, so that's the power of what we're talking about. Um, let me jump into a couple more things here. Kwong asks, uh, what versions of MS SQL are supported, Howard? So really all the, all the versions of SQL are supported, okay? Um, we're not application dependent. If it runs on Windows, it runs on a Windows 2008 R2 or newer platform, then we are supportive of that application and that instance of SQL. Okay, great. Uh, next one, the next two questions from Doug are related. The first question he asks is, does this work on a VMware environment or does it require uh, a hypervisor? Um, so I'll turn those over to you, Howard. Well, you know, we only install on the virtual machine in a, in a virtualized platform. There's no need, no, no software of ours that is installed on the hypervisor. So you could kind of think of us as being hypervisor agnostic. Uh, really doesn't matter whether you're using Hyper-V um, or um, ESX VMware, KVM, or any other type of hypervisor platform will work equally well. Great. Ken got a question in just under the wire, because uh, as soon as we're, we get to the last question, we're going to tie off here. Um, Ken asks, how does this technology hold up if Microsoft optimizes their OS? So, Howard, I'll turn that over to you. Well, you know, that's a really good question because Microsoft already tries to do some optimization. We just do it a lot better, plain and simple. We built a better mousetrap. You know, yeah, we, we did. And, you know, and, and it's interesting, too, because um, our company partnered with Microsoft uh, back in the day, and we actually, Howard, I believe you might have even have a few lines of code in there yourself. Uh, I think our company actually wrote the MuFile API hooks that are native to the Windows operating system. That is correct. And... Uh, you know, we have extensive internal knowledge. Uh, again, we're one of a handful of companies. When I'm saying handful, I'm really talking about five or fewer companies that have ever had access to the Microsoft source code. And so in looking at this, uh, our technology is deeply rooted in our um, significant understanding and behavior of the file system, actually even long before Windows had NTFS, um, going back to... Um, other platforms and so forth that uh, were built prior to, to Microsoft building out uh, their NTFS file system. Yeah, thank you, Howard. And I think inherent in Ken's question is what is the likelihood that Windows might uh, do something on their own uh, to address this? And it's probably pretty small because the design that is so embedded and entrenched in the Microsoft operating source code, it's been the same in every release as far as the behaviors that we're fixing, uh, and it's not going anywhere. On top of that, the DRAM read caching is completely separate from that. So I think we're in good shape, and our product uh, has a lot of longevity ahead of it. So we appreciate everybody attending. We are cutting off the Q&A now, so anyone else who drops in a question last minute, uh, we will get to you privately. We really appreciate everybody attending today. Thanks for sticking in there with us to the end, and we hope that uh, we have been able to answer your questions, pique your interest, and enjoy your free software. Thank you very much. All righty, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.